Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to the uh, Culture of Open Source panel. How many people thought they were going to hear us talk? Well, man, you're in for a treat, because we're not that interesting. We actually have uh, very talented and smart panelists uh, that we'll be calling up. Uh, this, uh, I'm Trek Lewaki. I'm an engineer at Groupon, also on the Ember.js core team. Um, I do a lot of open source. Uh, this is my colleague from Groupon, Sean Massa. I also work at Groupon. We work on the same team, actually, which is pretty fun. Um, and we wanted to put together a panel of people that like, I think we get to interact with a lot, and most people don't. Um, so I've been, I've been lucky enough and privileged to be privy to some like, amazing conversations about stuff going on in open source, and I wanted uh, to give everyone the chance to have that. So uh, we'll be doing a panel, we'll introduce the panelists in just a minute. Uh, we have a lot of prepared questions, and we'll be going through. Our goal as moderators is to sort of keep the conversation going in a very, very nice flow. Um, so if the conversation goes on a tangent that you all appear to like, we'll happily continue down that road instead of going with our prepared questions. But we have a lot of things prepared just in case. Um, we'll be doing audience questions throughout the talk. Um, so if you feel like you have a question that really fits into where the conversation is right now, uh, feel free to just pop your hand up and we'll run a mic out to you. Um, and then we'll also save time at the end for questions that you, you might have that didn't fit into the conversation in a natural way, but you still want to be able to ask the panelists. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, and then there's a slide about us again. That's us. Um, so our first panelist is Yehuda Katz. Yehuda Katz, please come up. Um, let's get make sure his mic is on. Uh, Yehuda currently uh, is co-founder of a company, Tilda. Uh, you may know him from projects like jQuery or Ember, JS, or Rails. I am lucky enough to be on the core team with him. With him. Um, very smart individual. How's it going? Oh, you have a talk later today. Is that uh, how are those slides? Oh, it's, it's impressive. Many hours in advance. This is, this is how Yehud is a pro, and I'm still not. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next up, Steve Klapnik. Um, Steve, you'll probably know from the Rust Project, where he actually also works with Yehuda. Um, what, do you, what, do you guys, what do you two collaborate on on that? I know you, there's like a package manager and a core language. We collaborate on convincing C and C++ programmers that their lives don't have to be terrible. <laughs> I think like bringing the perspective of the like modern tooling to like so for example cargo is a project that we both like campaigned for to actually get done and then did ship and people were saying like we'll never replace make files ever and then yep. now that they're using it they're like this is amazing <laughs> so. I, I would say like bringing modern open source ethos to a systems language is a much bigger project than it might I mean maybe it's obvious that it's hard but I think it's cool that like there's a web browser now that's built using a package manager. That's very <laughs> awesome. Right. Uh, next up, Brandon Keepers. Uh, Brandon is from my home state of Michigan, although we live on opposite sides. Uh, and he's been a long time GitHuber through, I think, a company acquisition, right? Yeah. Very cool. Is your mic on? Is my mic on? Yes, it is. Excellent. Very cool. Uh, what's it like being a GitHub? <laughs> uh, oh, good shirt, by the way. I like that yeah, shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we uh, coordinated today. Looks good. Uh, no, GitHub is great. Uh, it's, I mean, definitely the best place I've ever worked. Um, and there's always interesting challenges, but I think that's that's why we're here, right? Mm -hmm, Trying to solve sure. hard problems. Awesome. And then uh, last but not least, Erin Hickey. Erin uh, is the co-founder of With Known, and she describes herself as an information choreographer, which I think is probably the like coolest title. Is that like on your business cards too? Um, no, but because I make my own business cards, it could be. Oh, true. <laughs> true. And you have a very interesting degree. We were talking about it at dinner the other day. Do you want to go into a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so I have a degree in cognitive science where I studied psycholinguistics. And then the information choreographer thing comes from the fact that I also, my minors were in dance and English literature. And then of course I went on to study to <laughs> work in e-commerce and then marketing and then as an analyst and as a user experience architect. And now I have an open source software company. Very cool. All right, uh, let's get started with an easy question. Round one, round one. Easy question, ding, one ding, point ding, each. Ding, ding. <laughs> uh, so this is a question for uh, everyone. Feel free to go in whatever order you like. Uh, uh, how did you get started with open source? Like, what was your first contribution to open source? We can start with Yehuda. Sure. So I started programming really in serious in a serious way in 2005. I'm pretty sure that my first contribution was jQuery. My first real contribution was jQuery documentation. Um, this was back when the only jQuery documentation was a very bad wiki page. And I, I wrote a really, uh, what became visual jQuery, but a, a, like an interactive way of get it going through all the documentation, understanding what was going on. Um, and I, the reason I got into jQuery actually was, um, I remember I was just writing random code PHP or Cold Fusion or something. And I saw on what probably, like 
in my mind, it's Hacker News, but there was none. So whatever, however we got our news in 2005. <laughs> um, there was a project called Interface. And in particular, the thing that was really cool was that they had like a, sele a selection thing where you could, wh which is like the finder. You can like select a bunch of icons. And even today, I think that's like a pretty cool native-like thing that you don't see on the web that much. And I was like, wow, how does one do that? And it was like, oh, that is done through jQuery. And I was like, awesome. And so I got into it, and I realized there wasn't a lot of documentation. I was pretty noob, so I couldn't really do anything else. But I worked hard and leveled up. So I had a weird start because uh, so technically, I guess my first open source projects were me and my friends in college, just like writing software for funsies. But nobody really cared except for our small group. So that's like sort of a certain kind of open source, but not like in the bigger sense. And then I had a weird situation where I didn't really actually start contributing to projects. I became the maintainer of one. So and why the Lucky Stiff failed um, on Ruby, uh, I so like I'm going to help whoever decides to work on Hackity Hack. And then no one else showed up, so I was de facto in charge. <laughs> um, so that was my first like real serious contribution that then other people came and helped out with. Awesome. I actually can't remember what my first one was. Uh, I look. I went last night to look on SourceForge to see if like there was any <laughs> type of like contribution list or something, and I couldn't find it. So uh, I'm sure it was just some little project that I was using, like submitted a patch, you know, with CVS and like the whole email workflow. Um, but the, like the first I remember, uh, like 2006, I started using Ruby and Rails, uh, and I like I had a few patches to Rails itself to fix some bugs. Uh, and then, I mean, shortly thereafter, like, started releasing my own, like, small gems. So. I remember it was, like, super awesome that Rails uses Subversion. It was, yeah. like, Subversion is, like, the, the future. New, yes. Yeah. It's pretty great. And, and for the, the young people in the audience, uh, SourceForge is GitHub for old people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so, there are actually a few people from SourceForge here. I don't know if they're in the, this room, but they're amazing people. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it last night, and... So I started using open source products when I was in college. And then shortly after college, I started working with things like Joomla and WordPress and Magento a lot in my jobs um, to work with e-commerce platforms, open source e-commerce platforms, and to work on blogging and social networking things for my companies. Um, and I used to download a lot of things off SourceForge and play around with them myself. But I was actually thinking about it, and in terms of making a commit. Um, actually, if you look at my GitHub history, I had a GitHub account for a couple years, and I never um, did anything, basically, with it other than follow projects, download stuff off GitHub, use it, until more recently. And the first things, the first like activity on my GitHub account was issues for the project that turned into my company. And the first actual commit of code actually wasn't, um, for an open source project on GitHub, wasn't until this summer. Um, and I actually had to have my co-founder, who's our developer, completely reconfigure my computer um, <laughs> in order to get our company software running locally on my computer so that I could start to use it and push it back to GitHub. Because for the years, I'd always use MAMP locally on my computer to run WordPress and Joomla installs and Drupal and play around with that, but I've never committed any code back. Um, and to actually get that set up and working with GitHub and be able to use our own software on my computer, it took until about the end of June or July of this year before that worked. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Aaron, since you are a little bit more recent to starting contributions, uh, there was actually a, a study by Deanna Harrelson and she did an anthropological study on the Fedora community. And something that came out of that was that some people find it incredibly easy to get started with open source projects, and some people find it incredibly difficult. And that probably varies by project and other reasons. But like, there's a huge divide. It's not like you can really average and say, oh, on average, it's OK. Um, there's these two distinct camps. Um, so what we want to ask is that how, like, how difficult was it to get started with open source projects? And do you have any advice for like how we can make that easier? Yeah, for me, um, there are projects out there that have a really strong community and have been around for a long time. And just because of that growth in community support, um, it sort of reached this critical mass where lots of different people can get up and running fairly easy. 
So some projects, in my experience, have definitely been easier to work with than others. And I'm also not a developer. So um, I was thinking about earlier what keeps people like me from filing bug reports. And you actually have to be able to use the product or the project, whatever it is, before you can find something that you want to change or bug. And in my case, a lot of the smaller, less developed projects, um, I haven't been able to get up and running on my own, not because it's a bug, but there are HT access issues, or I don't have the config file set up right, or something that's not necessarily an issue or a bug report, but if I can't even use it, um, then I can't make it past that hurdle. So I've liked to play around with smaller projects. I like to um, use all the different microblogging clones that were out there for a while um, and see what those are like. The social bookmarking clones that were out there when Delicious was really popular, I play around with those for my own purposes. Um, but I found that the projects that really have that community out there, so when I run into issues that are usually because I don't know what I'm doing, I can search for it find what the problem is and get that fix in place. And if the community is just not very big or if it's hard to figure out what the problem is, that's usually a really big roadblock for me until I can find someone and ask them specifically, like, what's going on here? I'm sure it's a pretty simple fix. Um, and a lot of times it is. But in those cases, I usually have to find someone who has that knowledge to talk to about it. So kind of on the same topic, um, not on sort of a tangent from your point. I think it's actually really important for open source projects to care about things that are not just code. Yeah. This is like a thing that I've been uh, evangelizing forever, and I think I got it from John Rezig, who, who worked on jQuery. Um, like Ember has a number of core team members who actually don't contribute a lot of code and who might do infrastructure work or documentation or events, um, community management. And I think a lot open source projects in particular, even if they have people around who might be doing documentation or uh, community management, usually they're considered sub subordinate to the code group, right? So for example, Rails, not to call out Rails, but in Rails, any um, community work that's done is done at the behest of the core team, which is a bunch of people writing code. And I think that that actually, for example, Leia, who, is, who does events for the Ember core team, is more competent at doing events than anybody else on the core team. So it doesn't really, just like it would not make sense for me to ask her about piece of code I was writing, it doesn't really make sense for her to ask me about signage for the bathroom at EmberConf, right? <laughs> and I think there's, I think it's really important to allow people who may not necessarily have as their core competence that they're the best person to write code, have them be first class citizens in open source projects. And um, I think it's important to push back, e push back against the idea that that's like a second class part of an open source project. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. We described our work on Rust as being about community stuff, right? Like not even code. I'm paid to do documentation. I will have my first code patch in soon, hopefully, um, to the compiler itself, even though I write a lot of Rust code for other things. So yeah, it's super important. Yeah. So there are, uh, there are many subtle ways that a community of open source can spread its culture and develop that. Um, but there's also uh, activities people can do explicitly, um, like the code of conduct that this uh, conference has, for example. Um, other other things, or can you think of other explicit examples of taking a stand and saying like, like this this defines our culture and ex and communicating that very explicitly. So for us, um, we put in place an anti-harassment policy within the project at the very very beginning. So when there were really only just a few of us who had ever contributed anything or even knew about it, um, there was an anti-harassment policy just so we had that from the beginning. Um, and we've also m tried really, really hard to make ourselves as the core team members available for anyone because we are a new project, because we really are trying to develop our community and find people. Um, we want everyone to email us, to contact us. We jump on the phone and chat with people who are interested in using the software. We do, we've been doing uh, Google Hangouts. We've tried to go out and meet people in person. We haven't had any of our own events yet, but we've definitely gone to other events and worked with users and just sat down in the room with them and as much as possible try to make ourselves available. And we've had people contact us and say like, I'm really excited about this, I wanna contribute, I'm not a developer, 
we started out with a list of like, hey, please contact us if you want to contribute. We'd love people to do writing for documentation, design work, help us with community events, things like that. And I think we need to get better at really specifying specific things people can help with. Um, but we've definitely at least tried to throw out there, please come to us if you want to be involved. And so we've gotten developers, but also people in education, writers, designers say, I'm interested in your project. I'd like to help somehow. Like, let me know what you guys need. I want to participate. So I, I think one the thing that I said at Ember Conf last year that I think is often missing in open source culture is, uh, and I'm not a religious person, but a sense of forgiveness and redemption. Um, I think I'm using <laughs> perhaps overly religious words, but I think in almost all cases, people are not intending to do to be bad. Obviously, there are cases where people are like harassing or abusing, and the, that's not what I'm talking about here, right? But there are cases where uh, people do something that is clearly causing someone else pain, and I think we don't do enough of trying to help people understand the pain that they're causing and help them get help them improve and get better and redeem themselves. And I, and I think that. There's like sort of a backlash effect. It, the more and more we don't do that, the more and more people feel like they're always walking on eggshells. And I think um, there, it needs to be very clear that there's no excuse for bad behavior, but also very clear that we expect that people are good, inherently good, mm -hmm. and can learn from their mistakes. I think those I think, two things are important to come yeah, together. And it feels like the, the tone of the leaders of different projects uh, has a huge impact on how that community behaves. You know, like in Ruby, there's the saying, Matza's nice, so we are nice. I mean, he's the creator of Ruby, and like that is kind of pervasive throughout that, but then, you know, like there's other parts of that community that aren't necessarily the same. Yep. Um, <laughs> not, not, not pulling anything out. But like, I mean, if, you know, if, if the people on the core teams are really respectful in response to feedback, or, you know, like, they don't have to accept every contribution, but to say, Thank you for all the time that you put into this. I don't think you know this is maybe the direction we want to go. Like people in participating in that community start to echo that same uh, yep. Yep. behavior. I guess it's very hard to recover from making someone feel like you didn't respect them. Yeah, like that could be like years and years and years where now you have a person who hates your project and yeah. is very vocal about it. The like the biggest thing that changed for me was actually like running into one of those people at a conference. I remember. A few years ago, I talked to somebody, and they're like, yeah, you probably don't remember this, but in 2005, you responded to this thing that I said, and you know, like, he talked about like, the way that it affected him. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, like, this is a huge responsibility. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just totally shifts the way that like, every person that you're in interacting with, you know, they're an avatar in when you're interacting with them, but there's actually a person behind that. Yeah. So it's hard to mm -hmm. keep that in mind. So uh, sometimes the culture of open source is a factor for choosing when to use a project or not. Uh, John O'Nolan wrote an article about creating open source culture where he specifically called out Ember.js being selected uh, for their project, specifically because he felt that it was an excellent cultural fit, like their culture really matched the culture of the Ghost project. Um, what are your guys' thoughts of, about someone using culture as like a deciding factor for adopting a library or a framework? <laughs> yes. And culture is really like intangible. Um, like this is something we've talked about a lot at GitHub. Like we say we hire for culture, and we're like, well, what does that really mean? Like, right now we're a bunch of white dudes. Like, is that really what we're trying to hire for? So like, I I, I feel like I get what that's trying to say, but I don't know like how do you in in nature monocultures mean death, right? Like if you're all susceptible to the same virus, then one yeah. virus wipes out the entire population. Yeah, I'm, so, so that. You, you can't, it does make sense to choose something that you like and you tend to like people that are similar to you, but there are definite downsides from like only choosing based on culture or like saying specifically that that's what you're looking for. So I, I kind of think that there's a way of thinking about culture that is exactly like what you said and is actually something we care a lot about in Ember, um, which is, and this is something that I got from both DHH and the Postgres project. I don't cite, cite DHH that much, but um, DHH wrote a really great blog post really early on in the, day, in the Rails days called Why There Is No Rails Inc. And the idea was that instead of having a monoculture where there's basically one company that owns everything and you could think that 
37 Signals or Basecamp owns everything, but I think if you, if you compare it to like MySQL, you will notice that this is not actually true. Yeah. Um, so uh, the idea of having a project that has as one of its core values, the idea of uh, diversity is a loaded term, but the idea that there are like many different uh, companies and types of people that are, in, that are trying to use the project and that there's not one central locus of control that basically controls all the decision making. I think that is actually part of what Ghost was trying to say, actually. And I think that that's something that a lot of projects, it's something that people, in my view, don't put enough, pay enough attention to about big company projects. So I think increasingly, like Google, Facebook, et cetera, are getting good at doing open source. But getting good at doing open source out of a big company doesn't necessarily mean that you're producing a project that is representative of a wide swath of the community. And so like, this is a thing we've struggled with a lot about Rust, right? So Rust is a Mozilla project. But Mozilla really doesn't want to be like Google, you know, running the open source project. It wants to be more community. And how does that work exactly? And I think that's a, a cultural thing, but it's not about monoculture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So does anyone in the audience have a question about this topic? No? Yeah? They're all bored. <laughs> Uh, I was actually curious about the idea of uh, having a project that was led not by the team, because I'm accustomed to open source projects in which, you know, there's the leader, and hopefully everybody comes around, but if there's a problem, we eventually go talk to the leader. And I was interested by what you said of uh, a culture in which there isn't that. How so does that work? I don't think that's quite how I would describe it. I think it's, it's interesting, because there are definitely... I think people attempt sometimes to do a fully democratized project. But I think one thing that people often miss, because it happens often very much behind closed doors in projects, is that there's actually a fair amount of what Disney would call visioneering um, <laughs> that happens in open source projects. And kind of by definition, you don't necessarily want to leak out all the details of that, because the point of, the point of what you're doing is to make it clear, like, hey, everybody in our community, we think that the most effective way to use our project is X. or our plans are why, and you don't, you don't necessarily want it to be super confusing, right? So I think there's an aspect of that, and I think that that really fundamentally is the role of a core team, or like, and we have like nine people in the Ember core team. Rails has also a lot of people, um, hopefully a diverse group, but I think the idea is, is less about like writing every code and, that's, and, and certainly not making every decision, but it, it's about trying to steer the ship Right, like so basically, at the end of the day, if nobody is steering the ship, it's not going anywhere. Right, so some you need to have some group that steers the ship. And I think the more and more I've done open source, the more and more I felt like that role is actually can be pared down relatively small. So, for example, like the the Ember core team meetings, almost all the meetings are like uh, someone has submitted either an RFC or a or a pull request or feature, and it's like basically, is it ready to go or not? And like yes or no. The, the infrastructure behind that is actually not really most of what we do. It's more like, is this ready for prime time? Is it ready to be called stable yet? And that's actually pretty pared down responsibility. But I think if you can, if you can pare it down, you can get a lot more, my, you can have more leverage on your community, right? Because now everybody can do a lot of work and you're just kind of sitting there at the end to make sure everything, make sure everything's coherent, right? Like, I think, I think coherence is undervalued. I think you can, you sort of sense it in open source projects that don't have coherence where it's like, you know, person X might do one thing, person Y might do another thing, and they don't seem to have fit together at all. And you can feel when a core team cares about that. Um, so I think that that's the job, but it, that, sh that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to block through that group. And there's also a difference between going to leadership and going to a leader. So like, there's a big difference between a core team model and a BDFL model, right? So BDFLs uh, are nice as long as they are B. Uh, and then things can go bad. Whereas like with a more distributed, diffuse like core team, it's much worse, it's much harder for one person to end up like wrecking a project. And you still get a leadership element, but it's like distributed amongst a group of people as and opposed it, to- And usually one like one or two people have moral authority in such a group. Yeah. Right. Regardless of whether they're the BDFL technically. So awesome. what about open source projects that aren't that big? Like what do you think, I mean, what about ones that are just individuals? I mean, like is this, it, are any of the things that we're talking about like the same there, or is it all different as soon as there's a big team involved? It depends on your ambition, I think. Right. We're a two-person. I mean, we're a two-person team, and we ultimately like 
my co-founder Ben started the code as his project. So a lot of the, the influence in the community that we have right now, because we are so new, has come from people who were interested in what he was working on, and then people from our greater community, and then it sort of spiraled and grown from there. And at this point, um, we kind of function as benevolent dictators, and we are, because it's also our business, definitely on a daily basis trying to steer our ship in very specific directions. Um, and we'll see how it goes when we, when we launched openly. Um, at the end of September, we'd been doing, the code had always been open, but we had been running private betas with um, classes in higher education in colleges where the students were using the platform for their classes. And then we opened up a hosted service so that people who didn't want to pick up the software and install it themselves could use it free with us. Um, and we set a very clear sort of statement that our primary initial market is higher education and not just everybody, we're not making everything for everyone. And we spent the entire summer doing research and talking to people um, and trying to figure out what group of people, what industry made the most sense for our initial focus. And I was really worried that the greater population of people would be really upset that we'd focus just on higher education as sort of an initial market to launch with. Um, and it's been mixed. I would say about 90% of the people who use our platform right now are not in higher education. So we're definitely trying to figure out what makes the most sense in terms of um, this audience that we can customize and develop the product for who might work with us and help us survive financially as a company and keep everything alive and catering to a wider audience of individuals because we want to be something that everyone can use but we also want to make sure that it is a viable project. I think you just made actually a really good point, um, which is that there's actually a really big difference between a benevolent dictator, one person, and a pair of people. So like I, on Ember, work with Tom, where basically we are, I guess, in theory, BDFLs, but I, what I've noticed is that when you have a single person that runs the project, there's a lot of, basically, there's a lot of pain to absorb. And the one, one person absorbing that much pain, basically, there's like several ways that that can go, but none of them are very good. Mm -hmm. And you really do need, like me and Tom's relationship, at least half of it is just like giving each other pep talks. Like, <laughs> everything sucks. No, actually, look at all the stuff we've done. It's awesome, right? And I think if you're, by, if you're on your own, the BDF, like I think BDFLs tend to sour over time just because of the amount of, uh, of things, of burdens they're shouldering on their own. And so I think having two people that, and it sounds like you have that, and I think Rust has that now. I think Nico and Aaron work together closely. Yep. Um, I think have, like having, uh, having multiple people that help each other deal with the hardship, yeah. I think m you makes take, a bigger you difference than you would think. You take turns being burned out, basically. Yes, like. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome, so we have another uh, question from the audience. It's, it's, it's not so much a question, but an observation, I guess. My, my experience with, uh, with open source is a little bit different, you know, um, at least in my experience, I think growing that core team larger and larger um, actually helps because, first of all, it, it, it really lowers the barrier to entry for people coming in. If you go, say, see a pretty flat way of getting to have direction of steering the ship, and I think that's a powerful incentive for people to get uh, involved in it. Um, but also think that the larger the core team, you don't have that, that uh, fail-safe mechanism that you have a you know, benevolent dictator to make that decision for you. It kind of forces that core team to have a level of consensus. They have to work through the issues together. And I think that if that's done correctly, that can then like, leak down towards the rest of the way the, uh, the, the project runs. And so if the core team has to achieve consensus, then maybe the lower level, the contributors have to do that, and the users and the community at large as well. I mean, I can see there's, there's case, you know, use cases for both, but um, I don't want to diminish the role of, of a large um, you know, consensus-based uh, core team. So I'm personally like a, a really big believer in consensus-driven processes. I think the, the main failure mode of those processes are if not everyone in the group actually shares a bigger picture vision. Um, so 
I'm on TC39, for example, the standards body that makes JavaScript, and at least most days, everybody on the committee agrees <laughs> that what we're trying to do is make another version of JavaScript. When is ES6 coming out again? <laughs> Soon. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't end up mattering, right? It only matters when things ship. Uh, totally. Real politic. Um, but, I, but I think there was a period of time where not everybody on TC39 agreed on like what exactly it was that everyone was doing, and that was really, like the consensus process enabled it's kind of like Congress, right? Like in Congress, you have groups of people that don't actually agree fundamentally on what they're doing. So if you evolve away from, in that case, democracy towards consensus, now it's easy to blow up everything all the time. And I think as long as, long as the core team is contained, is sufficiently contained in size and has a group of people that fundamentally agree on what you're doing, then yes, I think you can have a lot of disagreements about tactics and then come to consensus. But if you have disagreements about strategy, you're in trouble, I think. And consensus takes practice and is a skill that you yep. need to develop because we are not socialized to form consensus-based decisions. Mm -hmm. But this is my Mr. Lefty. I'll just trail that off right there. <laughs> I, I think, I think yeah. you, can, you can see the value of consensus. You can see the Absolutely. benefits that consensus yeah. processes bring. It's just like our, our natural reaction, I think, is not consensus. Like, you know, when somebody says something that, dis that you disagree with, the reaction is to challenge that and yep. not to like, okay, well, where do we agree and like, how can we work from there? I mean, I think every consensus process, and Trek could, uh, could agree, every consensus process starts off with a big fight. Yeah. But the goal of the fight is basically just to get everything out on the table so everyone knows what constraints everyone has and all that. And then you're, once everything's out on the table, then you pivot to, to trying to come together. And I, I don't know, I've seen it work effectively as long as there's a strong leader who yeah. like, makes it clear the goal of this process is consensus, yeah. is to come to a conclusion. We're not leaving this room you know, until... Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned before that, especially the, the BDFL problem where one person's absorbing a lot of pain, uh, there's also this idea just being on the internet, you need to have a thick skin if you're going to interact with people. And there are people who agree with that and people who don't. But I know you had some, some broader thoughts on that specifically. Yes, so I have some thoughts. I'm sure everyone has thoughts. But I, I think for me, like the main point, I want to pivot the question a little bit. So I think the main point is that when you are running an open source project, you have to understand that you're in a position of power. And that doesn't mean that you have ultimate power. It doesn't mean you're the president of the United States. But it means that from the perspective of other people who are using your software, you are in a position of power. And I think it's important to empath try to empathize with the helplessness that people feel when they're trying to use your, what you're doing and they don't feel like they have any control or say in the process. So imagine if you're running an open source project, imagine tomorrow you were removed from the project and you no longer had any influence in it you would obviously feel very helpless and you might feel angry. And I think a lot of people on the internet, uh, when, they, when, when people say you have to have thick skin, I'm not talking about, there's many cases, and I think I'm not, I can't talk about every case of, of antagonism, but a big t kind of antagonism is people feeling generally helpless. And this is something that I've seen a lot, um, a lot on, in open source. I think there's a couple of strategies that, that are very effective. So one of them is there's a really good blog post you should Google called, uh, if you Google why wasn't I consulted or WWIC, it's basically just realizing that if you do make a decision and you didn't do enough ahead of time to make people feel included, they will feel upset no matter what you do. And I think anybody who, does a, who works on open source has experienced this where you basically feel trapped because you feel like you made an announcement of a decision and no matter what, you, you, you doesn't feel like you could have done anything and made everyone happy. And really one of the tricks is to make people feel like they had a say in the process, right? And, and I don't mean trick them into thinking they have a say and then do whatever you wanted anyway. I mean legitimately, don't let them, don't, it's not a democracy, don't let them make the decision for you, but make sure that you've heard what people have to say before you go ahead and make a decision. So that's one thing. Um, another really important thing is similar to the uh, pair dictator for life is you actually really need to have other people that are there to, de to deal with the frustration because it's not so much about having a thick skin like people are stabbing arrows at you, and more, there are a lot of people on the internet, many of them are feeling pain for some reason or another. Like I said, I think often it's helplessness. And having other people remind you of that, like I think we do this a lot in, in the Ember core chat room, just reminder, like this person is not a bad person, he's just feeling frustrated right now. I think it doesn't, you don't have to absorb the pain, it can help you remember that you're not, that you're, again, you're in a position of power. Um, and and also just try, like, like I said, try to recast it from their being angry to their being, they're lashing out because they feel helpless. And, I, and like I said before, I think it's important to remember that it's very, very difficult to recover 
from lashing back. So basically, under no circumstances should you ever lash back at any user of your software, no matter how justified you feel you are, both for tactical reasons. If they are actually a bad person, they will use it against you. Like if you, so, sort of like my, my mental model is always like Ferguson, right? Like when someone is protesting, when they're stepping up to the, uh, to the line and blowing raspberries in your face, the correct solution is not to pull out the pepper spray, right? Don't ban people. Don't, uh, don't respond to attacks by lashing back because remember that you're in an asymmetric situation. You're in a position of power, they're not. When people, are, when people feel powerless, they do a lot of stuff and the worst thing you can do in that situation is appear to abuse your power, so do not do that. Um, and then just remember that it's just hard to beat. So that's like one aspect of it and the other aspect is it's just very hard to recover. If you make someone angry early on in your project, by making them feel disrespected or they weren't listened to, they could become increasingly antagonistic over time and eventually there's really nothing you can do about it. You just have a person who hates you forever and might be very competent even and they just are angry. So yeah, that's my answer to the question. So it seems like a lot of uh, this feedback would take place uh, kind of like on places like Twitter, IRC, GitHub. Um, in, a, in a talk in this conference, uh, Stephen Vaughn Nichols said just earlier, uh, you're always presenting your project to the world via Twitter, in, et cetera. Um, like, how would you? How do you market an open source project or open source company? And what does this mean? Uh, and how, how do you track that you're doing a good job of it? Uh, you know, Aaron, you're running a company, so this is probably a good first question for you to pick up on or pick up on first. Yeah, um, we. It's something that we're always reevaluating. So we definitely started with like an email list. Hey, this is a little project back when it was a project and not a company. Like. Find out what we're working on, get involved, we'll send out updates. Um, here's the code on GitHub if you wanna jump in and join us. And then just really talking about it at different events. And we've sort of gone from there to turning into a company. And because we're a startup, um, we had to deal with a lot of things around are people going to think less of us as a startup because it's open source and will the open source community think less of us because we became a company. So how do we balance those two? And so far it's gone really well. We haven't gotten any negative feedback from people in the business world saying like, hey, you're an open source company, you're gonna completely fail. And the community that we have right now has been really supportive and is like, great, that's awesome that you guys are trying to do something to keep the product going, to become a viable community, to continue to, to develop it. Um, and for us, it's, I would say, 50% of the people who find us and jump on board sort of with our journey, it's not because it's open source. They found us through other channels, um, through presenting, through being involved in a startup in an accelerator through press that we've gotten through working with um, this network of educators who are focused on educational technology and giving students um, the abilities to learn how to set up their own websites and maintain control of their data and have ownership online. So um, <laughs> we actually have gotten to the point now that we're a company, we've launched, we've got users, there's an open source package that you can pick up and install, we have a hosted service, we're trying to figure out how to, um, how to work revenue into that, where some people think that we're a much, much bigger company than we are, and we're not. We became a company in May, and there are two of us who are actually part of the company, and some people think that, oh, it's just a tiny little dinky side project, and good job, guys, get back in touch in a year when you've really got something. Um, so it really depends sort of the context and how you're presenting yourself. And we've done a lot of speaking at events and hackathons and working with people in a variety of different contexts. We've picked up lots of audience and community members from various areas. I think this, what you just said, sort of goes back to the question that you asked before, which is like, is it different if you're a big project with a core team or not? And I think one, one thing, GitHub has done a lot of good things but one maybe unexpected negative side effect of GitHub is that it's, it's easy to put up a front for your project that obscures whether or not you're serious, whether you're, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of want to say like, like I sort of see my open source projects as adult projects as, even if they're not necessarily businesses, although sometimes they are, I see them as, I run them like I would run a business and they're serious and I'm not gonna, I would never abandon an open source project that had a lot of users. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's, it, it's good to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's good when you're running an open source project to be clear if you're 
if you're a person who has 100 open source projects that you spew out every single day and good luck if mm -hmm. it doesn't work or if you're if you're take if you're an adult if you're taking it seriously if you're and I think the best way to do that is to like not just like have a website but be responsive on Twitter like basically treat it like a business and be clear whether or not that's what you're doing yeah. mm -hmm. well, it's, I feel like it's hard too right now to differentiate like corporate backed open source projects from ones that are just really good at marketing themselves you know yeah. like to to the average person, like, what's the difference between like MongoDB and Ember? Like, because from the front, like, they almost the the way that they present themselves almost looks the same. Maybe that's a bad example, but no, I you, think know, you get what I mean. I like, think it, like Angular, Ember, like seem equivalent. Yeah, but. like like what's the difference in those? And like, it's getting hard to tell which. Like, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I mean, we're kind of like in this the wild wild west of like corporate backed open source. And so I, I just like I don't know where that's going to go. I was just talking to Tom about this last night because I was trying to figure out what to put into my talk, um, and I think there's like a good and bad thing about corporate open source. On the one hand, I think people don't people are okay with it, and that's good because I think I think what the best thing that came out of open source since the '80s is that it turned out that Richard Stallman is wrong. <laughs> It turns out that you can get away <laughs> with having. You'd say that. It turns out that you can have a really robust, powerful, vibrant open source ecosystem, even if a lot of people are making money off of it, mm -hmm. and even if there's a lot of proprietary software in the mix. The GPL is not about money, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if there's a lot of proprietary Star software in the mix. Always said that anyway, you can sell free anyway. software. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, I'm, <laughs> anyway, sure, let me I'm sure we'd all like to hear the rest of Steve's leftist theories. Uh, <laughs> but no, but but I one, think one last point because we're running sure. we're running short of time. Go ahead. Uh, I I think the. That's like the best thing that came out of it, so I'm not sad that Angular exists. Yeah. But I think it is true that when you're a corporate-run open source project, if the, corporate, if the corporation shuts down the project or dies as a company, that project is probably dead, and people should, I think, be more cognizant of that. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, cool. Uh, let's, let's do, uh, so Yehuda Katz, thank you very much for coming. Big hand of applause for Yehuda Katz. Um, you're giving a talk later today. Yes. What, what is that talk on? It's on Ember. Awesome. And it will be? Somewhere probably in this room? Yeah, I think this it's room. here. I think very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, Steve Clavin, round of applause. Thank you. you. You are also giving a talk this afternoon. Yeah, I'm speaking right after Yehuda, wherever he is, which I think is here. Which is also in this uh, room. So, yeah. great afternoon lineup, just basically sitting yeah. in this room. And it's about Rust, even though it's on the front end track. Yeah. It's very much not a front end talk. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. Rust is an awesome front end technology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Brandon Keepers, thank you very much. Thank you. And you, you also have a talk yes. this afternoon. <laughs> Same time as Yehuda's. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not like, talking about Ember, though. Oh, mm. You can slip in a little. <laughs> yeah. And Aaron Hickey, thank you so much. And you have a talk coming up this afternoon as I well. I do. It's probably at the same time as everyone else. <laughs> very cool. Uh, thank you all for attending. There's actually another panel in this very room coming up next about uh, women in technology and open source. Uh, so if you like this style format and want to hear about the next topic, please stick around. Uh, if you haven't grabbed lunch already, there's food outside. Feel free to grab it and come back into this room. And thank you so much for attending.